Our next speaker is Manohar. So Manohar did his master's from Georgia Tech. Um, he's also manages the computer vision and applied ML lab at uh, Facebook. And he'll be talking about video understanding, some of the opportunities and some of the challenges uh, in video understanding. Thanks. Thank you, Vijay. Uh, it's great to be here. Just minor correction, I manage the computer vision team uh, in the Applied Machine Learning Organization. There'll be a few people who'll be pissed if I say I'm managing the Applied Machine Learning Organization. <laughs> uh, but yeah, other than that, hopefully we won't have difficulty in getting uh, my slides up in full screen. Okay. There is a complication, let me come back. Okay, There's a, this is a religious thing, so we have to do this with shopping too. That's how we have good presentations, hopefully. Okay, uh, yeah, it's great to be here. Uh, I'm go happy to talk about some of the video understanding efforts, uh, uh, following up with uh, some of the nice demos and uh, efforts that Rahul highlighted from Google. Uh, so let's get started. So we have more than two billion uh, people using Facebook to connect. And uh, as part of that, we have the social graph. Uh, turns out, over time, when, when initially Facebook started, people st started communicating with each other. They used to friend each other. They used to write posts about stuff that they cared about. Uh, then they started using media as a way of communication. They started using photos as a way of communication. And then we started getting into the video age, where uh, video is uh, a very uh, sublime, it's, it's very one, one of the most uh, rich way of communicating, of indicating, of capturing the moments, of sharing the moments, and consuming the moments. So now the social graph is a lot more complicated. Uh, we have all of this content, and then we need to build the AI to understand this content. We need to understand what people care about, what they're talking about, and it's easy, or probably easier, to understand uh, when, when they explicitly call out the intent, but when, with respect to videos, it's a lot more tougher. So, so what I'm going to talk about is some of the unique aspects of uh, what you need to build as an AI backbone when you have these algorithms trying to understand all of this video content that gets uploaded every day, uh, that gets used as a way of communication. So if you look at a simple example of somebody capturing a video and showing, uh, sa uh, saving it and storing it and basically broadcasting it on Facebook, you have people having a conversation around the video. You have, peop you have uh, people reacting to the video. So it gives you a lot of metadata beyond pixels. So when you're talking about video understanding, we need to start thinking about all of this metadata, not just the pixels. So that's one unique aspect. And one of the reasons I'm excited personally uh, about this is given that more and more of our communication is going to be through video, it becomes even more important for us to build the AI algorithms to understand video. Then we can do a much better job of connecting people with each other and connecting people with the content that is happening every day. So we, we, we do it in many ways. One of the things that we have talked about publicly is uh, whenever you capture a moment and share it on Facebook, we want to understand that so we can do a lot, much better job with the services. 
So we built this platform called Lumos. It runs on billions of images, and it has more than 400 visual models that can be run every day on all of these photos and videos. And there are millions of examples that are used to train these models. As was clearly pointed out, some of the models are frame-based models. So when you're thinking about video understanding, you can go a long way by actually framing the problem on image understanding and then doing an aggregation over time. So that's exactly what happens with Lumos. You can actually use Lumos to do data collection. So let's say you want to build a model today for fireworks detection. It's July 4th, and you want to understand how many of these videos are about fireworks. You can do a really good job by using Lumos to go and say, let me collect data uh, for some fireworks. And all you need to do is type in some keywords, and you say fireworks, and it gives you a bunch of images that have the caption fireworks or a hashtag fireworks for that particular day. Now, obviously, when somebody says fireworks, it doesn't necessarily mean that image is of fireworks. It could, be, it could be very noisy. That's exactly what happens. So if you have human annotators going and correcting each and every label, it'll take you forever to have a really good model. So what we have is a bunch of nice tools around data annotation. So you can now cluster these images, and you can say this cluster is good, this cluster is bad. And for using, we, can, we have some basic features for the clustering so that we don't contaminate the training model, right? So that's exactly what happens. Now you have annotators who are 10x faster. So this is all part of the Lumos platform to be able to build a really good video model. So the next step is training. So one of the nice things is the deep networks that we have today, uh, even though they are trained on specific tasks, if the task is, if the number of tasks is a lot, and if the task is big enough with many classes, the representation starts to generalize, especially the lower level layers. So what you could do is when you have a new task, you don't necessarily have to train the whole model. You can actually train a model, a very small model, on top of this representation. That's exactly what you could do here. So here you can basically say, I want to train a model, and you have off-the-shelf deep networks and you, that you can select. So you have an advanced, there are a bunch of features. You say, I want to use this particular feature, and those features can be image features or audio features or text features, and then you can combine all of them as a multi-model model and then push it to production. So what you have done is you have simplified the problem of building a model from scratch to using the existing representations, using some annotation, annotated data with some noisy labels, and then you have a model that you can push it to production. And before you push to production, you can use Lumos to say, is it actually working? So you hit deploy, and you can see the curves, and you can see what happens with this model on the previous day data or the previous hour data. And if that starts to work well, then you know your model is actually good. So you have taken this very complex problem of I want a model for fireworks, uh, especially if someone without deep learning knowledge, and simplified it into these very simple steps. So this is one of the ways where you can actually take the existing technology, uh, the frame-based models that work really well, and apply it on videos. And you can see it not just for fireworks, but for many, many examples. So here are some examples for sunrises, uh, for food, and so on and so forth. Might not be a good idea to look at the dessert channel before lunch. But uh, other than that, it, it works reasonably well. So that, today, uh, as part of video understanding, you can actually use this for many, many teams. This is some work that came out of our colleagues in Facebook AI Research, where uh, Maskar Senan, uh, this won the best paper award in uh, ICCV. And here, what uh, we, we did is we have a model that can do instance level recognition. So when you talk about video classification, it, you're basically just saying there is a cat in the video, but you don't necessarily know where in the video it is and what pixels belong to it. So mask arsenon is basically something that we de designed for images, where when you have an image, you not only know whether that image contains a cat or a dog, whatever, it also tells you which pixels belong to a cat. So it gives you instance level recognition. What you could do, so these are some outputs. Uh, these are not ground truth. So it actually does a pretty good job on small objects, big objects, for uh, various kinds of objects. Uh, this is part of the Cocoa data set. But you can take this instance level uh, recognition network, and you can use it for pose estimation. So what is pose estimation? Pose estimation is basically telling you uh, the key points of a person. Why do we care about pose estimation? I, many of the data sets in video are actually about understanding the actions of what people are doing in the video. This makes kind of sense. If you think about videos on Facebook, or videos that we actually capture on a daily basis, it's about people, it's about our moments. So when you think about understanding video, you have to go beyond scenes, you have to go beyond objects, you have to understand what people are doing in video. So pose estimation is one minor step towards understanding what activities people are doing. So you can take this mask RCNN model that is designed on images, and you can apply it on videos, and it does a decent job. It, it actually does a pretty good job than what we thought initially. There is no temporal 
model or temporal alignment between the predictions of the image-based model. You are just applying the image-based model on every frame in a video. Let's take a look at another example where there is somebody is actually doing some acrobatics, right? So you have this one model that takes every frame in the video and gives you the segmentation of the person and gives you the pose estimation of the person. So that, that's pretty good. But when you have multiple people in video, then you start getting into challenges because you need to start doing association. So we had uh, uh, an algorithm that, has, that was a two-step process. So the first step is you take the state-of-the-art models like Mascar CNN, or you can even take some of the models that we did before uh, Mascar CNN called C3D, which are 3D coordinates that take small clips. And then using those, you can start predicting the key points of the person. But then when you have multiple people, you don't know which key point belongs to which person. So what you can do is you can do a Hungarian matching algorithm on the outputs of these frames, and you can go a pretty long way there too. And we are super happy that we won one of the challenges uh, in the post-track challenge at ICCV just two weeks, one week ago. So this, was, this is the output, and you can see how complex this scene is, and you can, it, the algorithm can still distinguish between one person to another person and get the pose right. It doesn't work always. Let's take a look at the, a tougher example. This is, this is much, much tougher. So it's, what, what it is telling us is we have some components that can actually work, but when you really push these models into videos with complex interactions, the frame-based models break. And that is one of the messages I want to convey. Yes, things work. We have amazing models that work on images, but really understanding motion and doing correspondence over time and understanding video, we have a long way to go. So one other challenge, as uh, uh, some of the examples that Rahul pointed out, is running these models on device. So what we did is we took Mascar CNN and we pushed it to the limits in terms of the model size, in terms of the speed. So here is an example where we are running it on your iPhone. So th this is pretty cool because your iPhone or your Android phone or any other phone can actually understand the, what people are doing in a video in real time. And then you can start doing things accordingly. Let's say you're capturing a live video and broadcasting it on Facebook. Then you can start thinking about various applications because you start uh, to get a reasonable understanding of what is happening in the scene. So we're just hanging out in the library at Facebook. Uh, this is another example where we took some of the existing technology of frame-based models of face detection, which is pretty well-known problem by now, and then tracking real time. And what you can see here is the person to your left is compressed using uh, the semantic compression, and the person to your right is not compressed using semantic compression. So you use the same number of bits, but the clarity on the face is extremely good uh, for one of the cases, for the, for the, for the person actually to your right, sorry. Uh, so person to your right is, is using semantic compression. So why is this important? You can actually reduce the bit rate when you broadcast videos significantly. And many of Facebook videos is a person talking uh, or broadcasting themselves or capturing other person. So you can, you can use existing technologies to basically empower many, many people, especially in the developing world. One of the challenges when we, so I'm going to talk about a few challenges and what we are doing as a company. So one of the challenges we face in video is obviously about our own infrastructure. So if you take the best image models, we have our work on image, uh, training ImageNet in one hour. ImageNet is a benchmark hopefully many of you know here, uh, where we have one million images and 1,000 classes, you have to do classification. So when we started in 2012, where after AlexNet, uh, won the, uh, AlexNet won the competition, it used to take almost two weeks or one and a half week we brought it down to one hour using distributed training. This is really, really critical because the architectures in image, image understanding have more or less saturated. There is a long way to go, of, of course, there. But in videos, it's pretty open ground. We don't know whether the model should be aggregations on top of image-based models or the model should be doing spatiotemporal convolutions all the way, and so on and so forth. So we need to do a lot more exploration. For that, we need the right infrastructure. So using the distributed training, in the, especially the ImageNet in one hour work, we are able to actually train models on benchmarks like UCF 101 and Sports 1 million that Rahul just alluded to uh, within a day. So previously, it used to take us almost a week to two weeks to understand whether our model, what our model is doing. Think of it, when you're doing an activity, you do something and you sleep for a week and then you look at the result. That's not the world you want to be in. What you want is a world where you get instant answers or especially as, as many answers as you can very quickly. So ImageNet in one hour is essentially that effort. And the other effort uh, is uh, there are many, many data sets that are coming out in video, some of them uh, mentioned before. 
we also are trying to kind of understand what are the limitations of the current data sets. One of the limitations clearly pointing out is, is the example where if you want to classify something as tennis, you don't necessarily have to do the hard job of finding the tennis racket. You can just do an easy job of finding the tennis court for most cases, so, uh, especially in, in case of video classification. So the current data sets, even though the data sets are huge, are labeled for various classes, you can actually look at correlations of various things, whether it's a scene or an object, and do a re reasonable job on understanding video. What we want is, our, can we build data sets where we push the models to really understand motion? And two of those data sets, I talked about this before in some scenarios, in, in some uh, conferences, we are actually going to make this public. We have an uh, exact date. It's end of January next year. One of them is SOA, and the other one is generic motions. So SOA stands for Scenes, Objects, and Actions. The reason we picked this particular data set is if you look at scenes and objects, there are some data sets like Places and ImageNet and Coco where you have models that can understand these. The explicit reason of creating this data set is in one data set, you have scenes, objects, and actions on videos. So if the, if the model is actually really good on frames, it will do a really good job on scenes, objects, and maybe some actions. But if you really push the models on all three of them, then you maybe have an answer that this model is better on video. It's just a hunch. We'll have to see how the community adapts to it and uh, works on it. Some nice application, uh, the way we collected it is it was free form. So we had annotators look at these short clips of videos. And we made sure in the short clips there are no scene changes. And then they annotate objects, scenes, and actions. It's uh, one of the nice things is about uh, the scale of the data set. Uh, we have a long tail of objects, long tail of scenes, and long tail of actions. And for each of these uh, occurrence, we have multiple instances uh, of the class. And we have some initial results on it, uh, which are encouraging because uh, the models don't have very high accuracy on this data set. That means we have to do a much better job on the modeling. So we, we found that we need to use motion and appearance to get good numbers. If you just use appearance or just use motion, you don't do so well. And then there are some open questions on how do we do a trade-off between accuracy and compute. Another uh, data set, like I said, is generic motions data set. So today, when we think about jumping, it's actually Jumping is an action, but jumping can be performed by people, by cats. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, and, and let, let's look at sliding. That's a panda sliding. It's a car jumping, right? You, you are actually associating a motion to many different kinds of objects. So generic motions is a data set where we are look, taking simple GIFs and uh, annotating them. This is a, <laughs> a polar bear sliding or uh, uh, the cat sliding and falling, right? Multiple actions, very small GIFs, so you don't need crazy amounts of compute to, to work on this data set. And then you understand generic motions, because it's not associated to just people or just objects. And there are some unique aspects, like I mentioned already. And preliminary results, which is very, very important, is if you just use RGB models, your accuracy is much smaller, whereas if you use RGB and flow, your accuracy is better. With that, uh, I want to end. I, we, uh, the data sets are just uh, one portion of it. Here are all the amazing work uh, that, that Facebook AI research and applied machine learning we have put out in the community uh, beyond data sets, beyond models, uh, to push the frontiers of AI. Thank you.